welcome to Ask Dr. Amy. And we're in the middle of winter right now, so I wanted to do a quick video on ear infections today because many of you out there might be dealing with this right now. First, there's my disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes. It is not medical advice because I don't know your child's specific case and it's just meant for us to learn something together. So ear infection, super common pediatric issue year round. The technical term here is called otitis media. We'll explain that in a second. So even though it's common year round, it's much more so in the winter because there are more viruses and colds going around this time of year. We'll talk about why this is connected. All right, let's dive into it. And we're gonna talk about five things today that you might not have known or might find surprising about ear infections. First, pulling on the ear does not equal infection. Now let's first define what we're talking about. If we're getting into the root of the words here, otitis is an inflammation of the ear, and media refers to middle. The middle of what? This is actually referring to the anatomy of the ear. So a quick overview, this anatomy explanation will be relevant to all five of our points today. When we say ear, there are actually three main parts, aside from the ear you see on the outside of the head. So first, there's the external ear, which is the ear canal. Let me just fill in some of the background on my drawing here. Okay, this blue area that I've filled in here, this is the middle ear, with these three little orange pieces that represent bones that are part of the sound conducting process. An important structure here in the middle ear is something called the eustachian tube. It's like a passage that connects the middle ear to the back of the mouth, so fluid can drain through. Now between the external and middle parts, there's a membrane here called the tympanic membrane. We also call this the eardrum. And this part separates the outer from the middle ear. So again, just to show you the progression of our three parts going from outside to in, you have the external, the middle, and the inner. This snail looking thing here is the inner ear and it's responsible for sound detection and balance. The official name for this part is cochlea. You might have heard of cochlear implants for deafness. All right, so the external ear canal here is where the Q-tip would reach, but of course, you're not supposed to use them. As you can see, if you jam it all the way up there, the Q-tip could hurt the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. So ear inflammation is about the middle ear here, and that's why it's called otitis media. Now within that, there are many types of inflammation. You could have an effusion, which is fluid. And the fluid itself can be clear or can be opaque depending on what's in it. Now fluid backup here is caused by a failure of the fluid and secretions to drain into the mouth, which is where it's supposed to go through the eustachian tube. And of course, one type of otitis media you can have is actual bacterial infection. Now remember, inflammation is not equal to infection. An infection with bacteria can be treated with antibiotics, whereas inflammation is a part of the body's natural reaction that just needs time to get through its process. It's important to remember at this point that all these types of otitis media can have the same symptoms, which are pain, fullness, discomfort in general. This can lead to pulling on the ear, or an older kid might be able to tell you that their ear hurts. It's way more common to have fluid than a true infection. In other words, it's way more common to have inflammation of some sort than an actual bacterial infection, which is why pulling on ears does not necessarily mean that we have a real ear infection. So that was our number one here. Now, why does this happen more in kids than in adults? And that brings us to point number two. Otitis media in kids is further anatomy related. And bear with me here, just a little bit more anatomy. So back to the fluid and secretions, it sounds kind of gross, draining it out, you swallow it in the mouth, but it's a cleansing process. If we can see this part from the front of the face, that connection is right here on an adult. On the left, it's a child's face, and the same mechanism is here. And here's a hint, look at the difference between the two arrows I just drew. When we are sick, there's extra mucus, just like there's extra phlegm in the throat when you cough. The tubes and its openings can also get swollen, which makes it harder to drain the extra mucus we already have. Now look at the difference in the angles. In adults, it's much more vertical. 
And in kids, it's shorter and also much more flat, more horizontal to the ground. So by gravity, this drainage system for kids is not as effective. As the tube is sitting here, stagnant, blocked by mucus, the shorter tubes make it easier for bacteria to go from the mouth back up in this area. But remember, this does not mean it's an infection every time. You have otitis inflammation, which can be with or without infection. Of course, anytime you have stagnant fluid with bacteria nearby, it can turn into an infection. And in that case, we call it acute otitis media, which brings us to point number three. This is the subtype that is an active bacterial infection. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Let me just show you this picture of what acute otitis media looks like when I look through the otoscope at the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. See, not only is it red, you see that it's bulging, and that's the important distinctive part. Bacteria make gas, so having an active bacterial infestation leads to more air behind the membrane, making it bulge out towards the ear canal. So an ear drum that's red can happen with any kind of otitis, but it won't bulge unless there's an infection. Now, sometimes your doctor might also use a bulb attached to the otoscope here to shoot a tuft of air at the membrane. And that's because a normal membrane is not completely taut. It's almost like a thin cellophane layer that you cover your food with. So when the air is blown at it, it'll crinkle and move. But if there's an infection behind it, the extra air pressure will make it taut like a drum. So when you blow air at it, it won't move. And that's another way to confirm the diagnosis of acute otitis media. Now, only active bacterial infections can be treated with antibiotics. And here is where the pediatrician is usually prescribing you with antibiotic, because only here will they work, will they do anything. Now, sometimes even an early or mild bacterial infection can resolve on its own without antibiotics, depending on the kid's age and how severe the infection is. That's the official recommendation by the Pediatric Association in conjunction with the ear, nose, throat specialists. They consider things like, have the symptoms lasted more than two days? Is the fever higher than 102 or 39 Celsius? We don't have to get into the nitty gritty guidelines here. Just keep in mind, when your doctor does not prescribe antibiotics, if there are symptoms, it means he or she does not see an infection or the criteria fits to give it 48 hours first in which case the infection can resolve itself and we save the patient a course of strong medicine that they didn't need. All right, say we have an infection, finish the course of the antibiotic treatment, but there's still ear pulling or other symptoms. This is related to number four, which is that there can be residual fluids after an acute otitis media for weeks. So assuming we had the right antibiotic for the particular bacteria, the infection is contained the extra inflammation can still take a long time to go away. Sorry, I wish I had better news. This is again part of being a kid, that gravity and anatomy are just not on their side in this case. And it's true, sometimes while the fluid is there, you can get a second infection, or maybe the first drug that the doctor chose wasn't correct. And this is why some kids seem to have several in a row, and everyone's different. So we know that some people are more susceptible to these than others. So thinking long-term for number five on our list, are there chronic consequences? What are ear tubes and who should get them? So the good news first, most kids do not have permanent effects from a few routine otitis media. We all have them. Sometimes, however, if we have frequent infections or effusions, there can be scarring, some hearing loss, etc. And that's when we ask ourselves, could ear tubes be helpful? It's somewhat controversial as some people believe that this procedure doesn't actually reduce the number or severity of ear infections. And there's constant debate, including among the pediatric ear, nose, throat doctors. So just briefly to describe, an ear tube is a small plastic channel placed into a small cut in the eardrum here to connect the middle ear to the external ear canal. Providing this opening, the thinking is, lets the fluid flow out, which will get rid of the effusion and lower the risk of infection. The current recommendation to consider this is when you have three episodes of acute otitis media in six months or four episodes in one year, including one in the preceding six months. So you can see from these guidelines, 
why accurate diagnosis of real acute otitis media is important. Otherwise, if we overcall it, the patient can qualify for tubes without truly needing them. And aside from these numbers, tubes are also considered when there are symptoms like hearing loss from chronic fluid effusions. Joint decision here is important between the family, the pediatrician, the pediatric otolaryngologists, which is the fancy way of saying ear, nose, throat experts. There are benefits and drawbacks. It's a procedure under anesthesia, and the exact usefulness in each individual patient is sometimes hard to predict before we do it. But just know that it's available as the next level of possible treatment. And of course, the default remedy for all otitis media is time. Time for the child's anatomy to grow into the adult shape. Time for fluid and gravity to clear the effusion and let it drain out. So there you have it. Five things you may or may not have known about children's ears, I hope, and your ears. I hope it gives you some overview on these very common symptoms and maybe help you talk to your doctor about them when you're discussing treatment options. As always, please let me know if you have any questions. Leave a comment and subscribe. And if there's another question you'd like to see a video about, please let me know. Until next time.